You know, if you trace it back, this day is significant because this is what led to that focal point in the whole coming and life of Jesus in his ministry. His greatest ministry was going to be accomplished on that tree. And this is the last step to that place. And it also all started back in the Garden of Eden, right? What necessitated Calvary? What necessitated Jesus giving his life as a ransom on that cross, on that tree? You know what? Sin. The sin of Adam has been passed down to all of his descendants. And God promised early on when he pronounced a curse on uh, the serpent as well as mankind because of sin, that he was going to deliver mankind and this whole earth from that curse and that he would do it in that way, that it would come through the seed of a woman, which is totally biologically impossible. And that seed of the woman would then crush the head of the serpent, meaning Satan, all back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I would have you turn again with me to Genesis chapter 48 because in fulfilling that promise, God chose a man called Abram. And God promised Abram a family. And that from that family of Abram, God would build a nation. And that nation would be the one through which this Redeemer, this Messiah, this seed of the woman would emerge. And as a result of his work, that we see him heading to the focal point of, as we think of Palm Sunday, he crushes the serpent's head. He defeats the devil. He takes care of the sin problem on our behalf. And so not only blesses the nation of Israel or the descendants of Abram, but he blesses through them all the nations of this earth. Through Isaac and then Jacob and now Jacob's 12 sons comes Israel. And from Israel comes our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus. Chapter 48 is very significant in all of this because in it, Jacob conveys God's blessing, God's covenant blessing, this blessing that was talked about in Genesis 3.15. He conveys that blessing to Joseph and to his two grandsons that came through Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. And what's interesting is that in doing so, Jacob actually legally adopts Manasseh and Ephraim as his own sons so that he can bless Joseph with that firstborn double portion. One portion going to Ephraim, another portion going to Joseph's son Manasseh. It's interesting to me also that in Hebrews 11.21, the only reference to the faith of Jacob, of all the acts of faith that we find in the life of Jacob, the book of Genesis, the only one that the writer of Hebrews points up is this incident that is recorded in Genesis 48. And it's this. The writer says, By faith Jacob, when he was a dying... He blessed the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. He was an old, tottering, dying man. But he blessed those two boys of Joseph, it says, and in doing so, he worshipped. You need to understand that what we are looking at in chapter 48 and uh, specific portions of it is the worship, is the overflow of the heart of this elderly man, Jacob. And I want us to uh, see just how this might uh, impact us. He's a man that, he did it by faith, 
the writer of Hebrews says. In other words, he was depending upon the promise of God. He was depending upon God's covenant blessing to be transferred to Joseph's two sons and thus to Joseph. He depended upon God's promise. Here's what I want to say to you on that note, and that is this. The Word of God and your dependence upon it is the most important thing in your life and in the life of your family members. And when you think about it, what we see here, a family interacting, worshiping, a family depending upon God's promise, depending upon the Word of God, I want you to realize that family is at the very center of all of God's purposes on this earth. Because it is through a godly heritage that uh, is passed from generation to generation that God gets things done on this planet. And the most important thing that you or I can leave to our family members is not a whole bunch of stuff or a lot of money. The most important thing that we can leave to our family members is a godly heritage. Cursed be all the other stuff. Cursed be it. All it does is cause family problems anyway. The kids fight over it. And they get bitter over this stuff. We bless them most when we give them a godly inheritance, a godly heritage. And I want to show you from this passage three ways in which we can do this. Some of you are parents. Some of you are going to be parents. Uh, some of you are grandparents. And all of this, some of you are single, but you're part of a family, an extended family. This is all important stuff. I want us to pray because of that. Lord, we need to hear from you. Uh, it's not enough that uh, we simply get uh, a man's opinion. And I don't want that to be this. I want it to be the very truth of God. And so we do pray to that end, that you would speak to us, that you would speak through your word to us. And uh, it would be really uh, tragic if you want to speak to us and we don't hear you. So, Lord, give us ears to hear as well. And that will only happen if we have a heart to do. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be the kind of people that be, would welcome what it is you have to say to us. The end result, it's our desire that Jesus receive the preeminence. And we have asked all of this in his name. Amen three ways in which you can pass on a godly heritage to your family or to others. And the first way is uh, in the uh, first half of this chapter, this 48th chapter, is to, and I see this in, in Jacob, to have spiritual care. There is a concern on the part of this elderly man for his descendants, his family. And there is a conscious attempt on his part to convey God's covenant blessing on his descendants by singling out Joseph and his two boys. Now, we may not have a covenant blessing like this to pass on to the next generation, to pass on to our family members, to pass on to others. But folks, listen. You must develop a spiritual care, a spiritual concern in your heart to be most careful, to be most concerned about the spiritual life of your family members and your loved ones. What I see here is him passing on that covenant blessing to his family. It's a solemn time. And uh, when he says what he does, it is an irrevocable, really an irrevocable transmission of God's special well-being for them. And it's significant because it's based on God's prophetic insight about these boys' future. 
and it was always reserved for a special uh, occasion, usually, normally, at the end of the father's life. And in this case, it actually involved, as I've said, a formal adoption of Joseph's two sons so that he can bless these grandsons just as he would bless his own son. And why is that? Well, in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, listen to this. I'm just going to read this. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, uh, for he was the firstborn, but forasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. Next verse says, but the birthright was Joseph's. Okay? So because Jacob's firstborn, Judah, sinned against his father and against the family, he forfeited the right to be the firstborn, and that firstborn portion went to Joseph's favorite son, or, or to Jacob's favorite son, Joseph. And of course, as a result of that, to Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now here's what I want to say about spiritual care that I see, first of all, pictured here in Jacob and his covenant blessing that he's passing on to Joseph and his sons. This calls for a careful mentoring on the part of those of us that have people that look to us. Now you may not have uh, immediate family, but we're all, if we're saved, we're all mentors in some sense of the word, aren't we? And so I want this to apply to you, but this is a call for careful mentoring, that you own the responsibility to see to it that you have a godly impact, that you have a godly influence on, first of all, your own children, if you have them, or your grandchildren, if you have them, because that's what Joseph, uh, that's what Jacob's doing here. He's having a godly influence and impact upon his son and upon his grandsons. And he, he is seeing to it that they receive this covenant blessing. This is a part of our responsibility that we need to own. It needs to become something that we see serious and become careful mentors of those that we love that uh, we pray for the generations that follow us. I know I've said this before, but I'd like to remind myself, and I want you to catch on too. I pray on a regular daily basis that God would give my wife and I uh, a godly heritage of grandchildren all the way to the rapture. I don't want there to be any blank outs. I don't want there to be any interruptions. I want a godly line from us to continue until Jesus comes. That's the, the kind of things I'm talking Careful mentoring. You know, my wife and I had the joy this past week of uh, gathering together with a few of our family members to celebrate my mother's 95th birthday. And... Uh, my wife and I have developed a little tradition in our family that whenever someone in our family has a birthday, uh, we take time to just stop and have everyone to say at least one thing that they thank the Lord for about that person whose birthday it is. And so I remembered to do that at, uh, when we were uh, sitting there celebrating my mom's 95th birthday and we went around the table and, uh, or around the, the living room there and we shared one thing we're thankful for. And then the birthday girl herself, after we were done, she spoke up and, and she said, you know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for a godly grandmother. Her father's mother uh, lived with them for uh, a few years, and as a result, that grandmother 
uh, prayed for her son and his wife and their daughter to get saved and used the opportunity of living with them to witness to them. And eventually, my grandfather, my mother's father, got saved. And then his wife got saved. And then my mother got saved. And uh, it was all because of this grandmother. And uh, we had there uh, on uh, Tuesday of last week, we had four generations that uh, were saved. Four living generations. And the grandmother that had, uh, uh, that had witnessed to uh, her son and his wife, that would have been the, a fifth generation, and she would have made a sixth generation. So there's been six generations now of saved people as a result of that one uh, grandmother that loved the Lord and prayed and witnessed. What am I saying? I'm saying we have a responsibility before God to be careful mentors. I don't want to wait until my, my children are 12 or 13 in order to make sure that they're saved. Uh, we were on them from their earliest days teaching them so that they knew the gospel. And uh, what I see here uh, that uh, really is a part of careful mentoring, three things real quick. First of all, I see affection. I see Jacob drawing them near. You see that? Uh, in fact, in verse 10, uh, he, they, they draw near to him, and he kissed them, and he embraced them. That's affection. He draws them near. You know, there's something about, about that personal human touch. Your children need that. Your grandchildren need that. They, they don't need to just hear it. They need to see it. They need to feel it. Your children and your grandchildren, people need to feel loved. And uh, that affection is so much an important point in careful mentoring. You can't mentor people that don't feel that you love them. And so that's, that's one thing. Another thing is expression. Because not only affection, but expression. He's, he's speaking encouraging words to them. And so they know that he cares. They know that what he's saying is, is love being expressed. So there's affection, there's expression, and then he lays his hands on these boys. And I understand, you know, that that's a special uh, benediction that is being given. He lays his hand on the heads of these boys in order to transmit that covenant blessing uh, that was from God to Abraham to Isaac to him, to them. Can we, in a spiritual sense, transmit the blessing of God into the lives of our children and our grandchildren and people that we love? I think so. I think there's a sense, if we have life, I think that that life can be generated. I think that that life can be transmitted. I think that it must be. So there's that laying on of hands, that, that benediction. And by the way, this is the first time in the Bible that we ever have someone laying their hands on the head of another. A benediction. A blessing. That's exactly what's happening here. That's all a part of spiritual care. But there's a second thing, that uh, if you want to have a godly heritage, not only spiritual care, but look at verses 15 and 16. And he, Jacob, blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude into the midst of the earth. Second thing is that I see here, if you want a godly heritage, there has to be spiritual care, but there also has to be spiritual experience in your life. There has to be an expression 
of active experience of a personal connection with God in your life. Otherwise, it's dead. You're just telling them things that have no life in them. There has to be a personal connection, actively in, uh, connected with God in your own life. You have to have spiritual experience. And what Jacob is doing here is uh, he's showing how God is a covenant-keeping God to him. He recalls meeting God and experiencing God's presence and remembering God's promises that God made to him and recounting God's faithfulness and goodness to him. He blesses them and he blesses God as well. Interesting to me is just how he speaks it here. He, uh, he talks about, um, he talks, he, he really blesses God here, not just his boys or his grandsons, he's blessing God here. And there's a threefold blessing of God. First, uh, a blessing of God who is the Father. He, uh, he addresses him as literally the Elohim, that is the one and only true God. And then he addresses uh, him as, in verse 16 as the angel which redeemed me. That obviously has to, to point to Jesus, the Son, uh, God's Messiah. He is called here the the the, uh, the redeemer the uh, the continual uh, goel if you will the one that continues to deliver he is you know the 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 son was the one that uh, uh, the firstborn son had the responsibility to take the place of being the redeemer in the family the one that uh, that saw to it that the family was was kept intact. And so here, it's related to Jesus the Messiah. He's the angel that appears to Jacob over his time. And he is the continual redeemer. And then there is also reference in that end of the 15th verse, the God which fed me, literally shepherded me, shepherded me all the days, all my life long unto this day. And uh, it's not said to, to, to be so, but... Uh, it's possible that this is a reference to the Spirit of God. That's his job, isn't it? To, to shepherd his people. The word fed means to be to shepherd. And by the way, this is the first biblical reference in the Bible to God as the shepherd of uh, his people. And uh, so he blesses God, and in, in, without uh, uh, stretching it, perhaps he's blessing the triune God. Father... Holy Spirit and Son. And then he blesses the boys. He blesses his grandsons in, in the, uh, these two verses as well. That, that, that God continues to fulfill his covenant promises uh, is, is something that just thrills the heart of Jacob. And basically he says, I want you men to have the same response to the God that I just blessed that uh, our forefathers did, Abraham and Isaac, and of course, myself. What we see here in this blessing, first of God and then these two grandsons, is we see evidence of Jacob's faith. That's Hebrews 11.21 that I've already made reference to. So there is spiritual care uh, on his part, and he references God being covenant keeping. But let's apply that to us. Let's apply that to us. The, 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 the spiritual uh, care and then uh, the spiritual experience. How do we relate the spiritual experience that we've had with God? Well, we can't relate it if we haven't had it. But I think what it comes down to, if I could just sum it up, count your blessings. Start counting your blessings. You remember the song, count your blessings, name them one by one? You should do that on a regular basis in your life. That should be a part of your home life. That should be a part of your personal life. 
and your home life that you count your blessings by giving real examples uh, that relate how God has worked in you and through your life and your family's life. You should have those kinds of stories to share. Your family should have them enshrined in their memory. That God has worked in my life. God has worked in our lives. And you count those blessings. You make much of them. First of all, God's faithfulness. Our kids, and that's, that's really what he's doing here in these verses. He's talking about God's faithfulness to him, Jacob. And our children and our family will recognize by our attitude and by our words that uh, God's always able to be trusted, that you can always rely on God. He's always good. And uh, give an example, give examples of that, how God has been so faithful to you and to you, your family over the years. You know, I hate to keep uh, looking at myself and my family, but I, it's what I'm most familiar with. But, you know, I just said, if we could trace back, we could go back six generations on my mother's side. Well, some uh, distant relative years ago uh, did a genealogy of my father's side, and we found out that uh, my great-grandmother, I don't know how many generations back, seven or so, back in the in the early 1700s was saved under the preaching ministry of uh, Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf who became the founder of um, a movement he didn't mean to found but it was called the Moravian movement and as a result they moved from Germany to uh, Pennsylvania and uh, they bought a farm and then they donated some of that land to build a Moravian church and uh, the second to building still stands today. Now the Moravian church is a liberal denomination today and uh, I wouldn't own it. But back then they were very evangelical and, uh, and they, the Moravians were the beginning really of the modern missionary movement uh, in our world. But anyway, so you know, and uh, they were obviously saved people that came over here from Germany, but then somehow all of that disappeared, and it didn't, uh, and God didn't reappear in a saving way in our Bickle family line until a neighbor on the farm where my dad uh, was born and brought up asked them to go to church. And so my grandmother and my dad and his sister went to church and they all got saved. And my grandfather, who died when my dad was just a 13-year-old boy, on his deathbed supposedly made a profession of faith. Well, God called my dad into the ministry and he became a pastor. And uh, so here it's like our family was saved, they turned away from the Lord, God in his mercy reaches down again, brings the family back to the Lord, and here we are. What am I saying? I'm simply saying that God is faithful. We don't deserve any of his mercies. He is so patient. I was thanking the Lord as I was walking and praying this morning on my walk, just thanking the Lord, how do you put up with you're so patient and so merciful. Don't deserve any of it. He's faithful. And like a shepherd, he tends us. He cares for us. He keeps us. He directs us. He provides for us. Personal examples, that's what you need to share with your family members. Personal examples of how God tends you and your family. Uh, uh, they don't necessarily have to be very dramatic but uh, share how God has met a need let it be known don't keep it to yourself let it become family story I remember when my wife and I we had four kids at the time and, and we, were, we didn't have a decent vehicle 
and uh, someone gave us a vehicle, but we had four kids, and, uh, and it was a, a little, uh, uh, like, compact car. And uh, so there was a seat for my wife and I up front, we had four kids in the back seat. That was before car seats, I guess. But anyway, we, we prayed, and we asked the Lord to provide us a vehicle. And I remember there was a man in our church he was a, a naval officer because we pastored near a sub base. And he said, you know, my wife and I, we're, uh, we're going to be moving. I'm getting out of the Navy. We're going to be moving. And uh, we're going to go look for housing. So they went to look for housing. And one night he called and he said, Pastor, my wife and I have been talking. We just got out of church down here where we are looking for housing. And the Lord laid it on our heart separately to give you and uh, your family one of our vehicles before we leave. And uh, so I knew he had a kind of a decent vehicle and then a brand new one. And so I said, well, you know, <laughs> we're not looking for anything. Just be sure that that's what God wants you to do. Well, when they left, they didn't give us the older car. They gave us the brand new one. We, had, we hadn't told anyone, but my wife and I had been praying for a car and our kids had uh, probably in our family devotions as well for quite a while. And so that was a major answer to prayer. Our kids got to be in on that. They got to see that. And uh, we drove that car into the dirt. I mean, we, <laughs> we got every inch of life out of that car that we could. But here's God. That, that's the kind of stuff... This is all the kind of stuff that you need to relate. Your family members have to see an experience with God. Count your blessings, His faithfulness, how He tends to all your needs. And jo uh, Jacob here talks about how God delivers. He's the Redeemer. He's the Deliverer. How He delivered you from sin. Your family ought to know your, your salvation testimony, if anyone ought to know it. Your family ought to know how God's delivered you and saved you and how He's protected you from, from danger. You know what? I'll bet that there are some miraculous stories. Certainly salvation is a miracle, but I think there's miraculous stories in your, uh, in your testimony that you need to relate that to your loved ones. They need to know how God has power to work miracles, whether it be a healing miracle or, or uh, any kind of deliverance. I, I can remember a couple of times when my vehicle was out of control. I could not control it, and I just cried out to the Lord, and all of a sudden that, that car was back in, in, you know, in line, and I didn't do it. God did it. I, was, uh, I remember uh, waking up side swiping the guardrails. I had fallen asleep at the wheel. And uh, I, I, I was side swiping the guard, but just, just enough to just put a crease in the side of the car. The angel of the Lord woke me up, I would say. Oh, yeah. But anyway, count your blessings. Count your blessings. Show God's faithfulness. Talk about it. There ought to be spiritual experience that you can share with people that's real, that's genuine, that, that they know that, that uh, the God that you say you love and serve is a real person and really works. And then third and finally, not only spiritual care and spiritual experience, but if you want a godly heritage, there's got to be spiritual vision that you cast. There's got to be spiritual vision. In verses 17 to 22, I'm just quickly going to read it. Uh, Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim. It made him angry. It displeased him. He, he wasn't happy. And he held his father's hand, removed it from Ephraim's to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said, you shouldn't bless uh, the, the younger, but the firstborn. He tried to change it. And in verse 19, Jacob says, no, you're wrong. God's shown me. I know. He'll become a people. He'll, he'll be great, but the younger will be greater. Verse 20, And he blessed them that day, saying, And thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said Ephraim before Manasseh. By the way, that's the, that's the formula that they use when they ordain a rabbi. Same terminology. Make them as uh, Ephraim and as Manasseh. And Israel said when they lay hands on a rabbi, and Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, 
God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Cast a vision before your children, before your grandchildren, before your family. And that vision ought to be God's vision for them. You ought to have a sense of God's vision for your family members. What he's doing here is he's relating the covenant plan that was passed down to him from his father Isaac, that was passed down to him from his father Abraham. He's rehearsing God's plan for Israel, that they're going to return to that land that God promised Abraham, and they're going to claim it, and they're going to prosper in it, and uh, it's going to be the fulfillment of all of God's promises and plans for Israel. That's what Jacob's talking about. That's his spiritual vision. It's the covenant plan of God, and he was so convinced of it that uh, uh, when it came down to it, to actually giving the blessing, the Holy Spirit not only directed him how to give the blessing, but who to give that blessing to. And it was according to God's plan and not Joseph's plan. And it says that he did it knowingly, wittingly, meaning knowingly, even though his eyes were dim, even though he was probably what we would call legally blind, uh, he still knew what he was doing because God's hand was behind Jacob's hand when he was blessing Ephraim, the younger, instead of the, the older, the firstborn. He was convinced of God's covenant plan, and he also talked about the fact that he and they would be conquerors. He was assured by God's power that they'd return to the promised land. And he gives Joseph, the firstborn, a double portion, which is exactly what the, later on the, the law of Moses would say. And interesting to me that in Ezekiel chapter 47, I think it's verse 13, uh, in the kingdom, the tri Joseph's uh, descendants will have two parcels of land. And that, uh, uh, again, just connects with all that's being said here. But uh, notice, this is interesting. In verse 22, Jacob says, I give to thee, to Joseph, one portion above your brethren, that's land, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now, that's a specific parcel of land that Jacob conquered that the Bible makes no mention of. There is a play on words here, not uh, visible in English, but uh, the word portion is the, the word sechem, and uh, the parcel of ground is the city of Shechem. And so he is saying here that uh, J Joseph is going to get that parcel, Shechem. And we know that that was, the, that was the place where Jesus met the woman at the well. It was Jacob's well. She was getting the water out of, right? And so this is exactly what he's prophesying here. And he says he took it out of the hand of the Amorite, and so, again, a biblical event that we don't know, uh, uh, it's not recorded in the Bible, but it, it happened. And also, I think it's interesting that in Genesis 15, 16, when God makes the covenant with Abram, it, uh, Jacob's grandfather, he said, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come hither again out of Egypt into Canaan, the promised land, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, the sin of the Amorite people will have reached to heaven and it would be time for God to bring judgment upon the Amorites and you will conquer them and take that land that I've promised to you. Interesting. Now, let me just uh, finish with this. Spiritual vision. That's what Jacob shows here and that's what you and I need if we're going to have a godly heritage. We have to learn to cast God's vision before our children and our grandchildren. And in order to do that, you need to be able to verbalize and articulate to your family the vision that God has. That is, you need to instill in them a general knowledge of the will of God. 
There's stuff in the Bible that tells us this is what God wants from every believer. That's the general will of God. And then you need to equip your family members with biblical principle so that they themselves will be able to discern the specific will of God for their lives. My wife and I were very careful not to tell our seven children what we want them to do for God or what we want them to be when they grow up. And neither did we bug them. What are you going to be when you grow up? But we prayed and we put before them the general will of God on a, on a regular basis and we gave them principles to discern the specific will of God for their life. And by that uh, I simply mean we pointed, and this is what you must do in order to communicate this purpose, this spiritual vision, uh, to point to their life with God at the center of it, God at the center of their plan, to live and to uh, learn, find out what God wants, and make that your goal in life. Find out what God wants you to do. Find out what God desires, what pleases Him. Point them to God at the center of their life. It was never our desire, even though for, you know, I'm not uh, complaining, but uh, for, uh, you know, a, a period of time in our marriage, we were very, I was a poor preacher, all right? Sim simple as that. We never, never wanted to pressure our children to become you know, highly successful professionals that would be able to bring money into our family. That was never even discussed. We never even pressured our children to go into full-time ministry. We only focused upon the fact that they need to find what God's will is for them. Make Him the center of their life. That was the spiritual vision that we cast before them. Not worldly success, but do what God wants you to do. And uh, by storytelling and examples, we live and we teach and we give our family vision. We give them purpose, God's purpose for godly living. Uh, we, we show them we're here not for ourselves. We're here not to take but to give. We're here to bring others to Jesus. We teach them personal evangelism and we teach them the necessity of world evangelism as well. Our discipleship doesn't begin in the church. Our discipleship begins in the home. And mom and dad are the disciplers. And the children are the disciples even before they're saved. We're discipling them to Christ. And then once they come to Christ, we're showing them how to live for Christ. By not just what we say, but what, how we live. We're casting a vision before them. We're communicating the purpose. As Jacob communicated the covenant plan, we're communicating the purpose of God in their life. Well, folks, this is how to have a godly heritage. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen haphazardly. It doesn't happen except you plan for it to happen. And it doesn't mean that you have to be any level of intellect. You don't have to be anything but walk with God. You only have to be dedicated to God, and God will take care of the rest. After a distinguished performing career, a virtuoso violinist accepted an appointment as a professor at a leading uh, university. And when he was asked what prompted this change in his career, he simply said this, and I quote, Violin playing is a perishable art. It has to be passed on as a personal skill, otherwise it's lost. We need to listen to this great musician. Living the Christian life is a highly personal experience, and we can't pull it off by merely watching skilled veterans perform for us. We need hands-on instruction. We need personal experience with God so that then we can pass that on to our family members that they might then pass it on to the next generation. I don't want it to stop with my generation, do you? I want a godly heritage that as I pray every day will last until Jesus comes.
I think that's what he wants too. And because that's his will, I pray with confidence I know it's going to happen. A godly heritage. And it all harkens back to that day when Jesus, when he went into Jerusalem, knowing that was going to be his last trip. He'd be hanging on a tree in hours. It's all possible. All of this. Here we are today. It's all possible because it's all happened because of him. Amen. And we can have a godly heritage, although we don't deserve it. We can have a God. We're not deserving. Jacob said early on, I am not deserving of the least bit of your mercy and your truth. And I say, Amen, Jacob. I, I agree. I agree with that. But he has been so merciful and good. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that this might really resonate, that we wouldn't be forgetful here, as this would resonate deep within our soul, especially those of us that are parents or grandparents, especially those of us that have loved ones that we're burdened for. We have little ones that are either going to grow up and be a worldly success and perhaps a spiritual failure, or perhaps they could be both. A worldly success and a spiritual success, I don't know. But I pray that our goal would be to see them grow up to live out a godly life. Because they see it in their parents. They see seriousness and solemnness in the life of their parents. They know their parents mean business for God and not playing church. And not pretending to be anything but real. Real believers humble believers that walk with God. Oh, God, make us that. Make us that, we pray. Give this assembly, Bethel, godly men and families, godly men and women and families, that it would uh, increase and grow until you come. In Jesus' name, amen.